Yeah. This is my hair, all right? Hey, you want another swig of water? Huh? You want another swig of water? I don't care. No, I don't care either. Do you like it? Where is it? Right here. Why is it way out there? I can hold it over here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, boy. <coughs> uh, Mike, you ready yet? Uh, one quick change. Don't drop it. <laughs> Stop pulling it, Dad. I was going to pull sir. it back. Okay, you ready? Everyone's fine. So okay. Reverend Lowry. <coughs> they twisted around. 20th. They're not turning around like they ought to be. My I pants. Like to see that. My pants ought to be more this way. Please tell us when, Mike. Also, okay. Also, be careful with your footing now. Yes, please. yes. And turn it towards that camera. Put it a little closer to him, though. No, no, no. Towards him. He's a focus. Okay. And go ahead. And marking. And Okay, what do we do about that door? Just do open the door. Hopefully nobody has to go out of Okay, let's make sure no. Brian, can you stand outside? Stand it's okay. Okay. All right. Reverend Lauer. Thank you. Now, wait just a minute. When my sister pulls out, it's going to rain. Like, uh, wait a second. Okay. As well, um, this shot is a good bit tighter now. And, um, it's going to vary. It's going to vary. No, don't, don't change out. anything, please. It's going to vary. Oh, you yeah, have a sensor? Um, Sam, yeah. 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 be mindful of your Hey. Yeah. Choice to keep I have. Okay, she's gonna pull out, right? Yeah, but she's. The God to glorify. Let's cut, let's cut, let's cut. Okay, cutting, 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 hey. cutting. I have a cut on the camera, so. Yes. Oh. No, just stand so, out oh, there, gosh. please. Right, Daphne, aim it towards that camera. Okay, open up, open up, and mark it. Okay, everybody settle, please. Or two foot, that's the Yeah. Okay. Settled. Okay. Reverend Lowry, tell us when you first met Mamie Jackson and where, if you remember. I don't remember the year, but I met him when he, he came back to Atlanta from North Carolina, I think, and um, got right into politics. And uh, he decided to run for the Senate, I believe, first. And I told him, I said, you can't, witness in it, but you can stir up some noise and raise some issues and and get your name known in every bedroom. So he ran and lost as we expected. But then later he ran for for mayor. And he was suited for the job. The Lord made me to preach. He made Maynard to be a politician. He was a natural politician. He loved people. He made people feel at home with him. And he was a, had a formality that was discomforting to some. I used to tease him and said I came to his house one night at 2 o'clock in the morning and he had a shirt and tie on, 2 o'clock in the morning. Wasn't true, of course, but it sounded like Maynard. But he was a good politician. He remembered you, he respected you, and I'm glad I knew him. I loved him, glad I knew him. Now, when he first ran for mayor, there were some people, hold on one second. Sam, I've got a problem. I'm sorry. Problem. Let's cut. Uh, got it. Thing here. Are you ready? I'm ready. I know you're ready, ready. Mike, you ready? Yes, sir. Okay, take three. And so roll. Turn it towards that camera a little bit. Okay, and go ahead and mark it. So, so Reverend Lowry, when 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 Maynard was 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 running for mayor, there were some people in the black elite in the community who weren't happy with it, like Jesse Hill. Why were there people who were opposed to Maynard running for mayor the first time in the black community? I can't imagine why. No. 
I think he was eminently qualified. He uh, had a right to run. Uh, we never had a black mayor, and it was time. So I was glad to see him run. Voted for him. Encouraged other people to, to vote for him. I thought he'd make a good mayor. So when he was in his first and second term, he was having some difficulty with, you know, the, the, the Atlanta child murders and stuff. What was the reaction of the community in the church the way Maynard was dealing with those issues? Well, that issue of child murders was one of the saddest chapters in a book called Atlanta. But Maynard handled it well. Um, he and I talked often about it. Uh, had he not been the mayor, I would have been leading demonstrations against City Hall because we were impatient that they couldn't capture the culprit. So he didn't chastise me and I didn't chastise him. But it was a sad chapter in the life of Atlanta, Georgia. What was Atlanta like when you first came here? When you moved here in 68 and you became the pastor of the Central United Methodist Church, what was Atlanta like before men had became the first black mayor? Well, Atlanta was not a typical southern town, but it was southern. And had much room for improvement, which a black mayor would address. So I was glad to see Maynard's change, what he meant in terms of change to Atlanta. Not many people, a lot of people didn't think Atlanta would elect a black mayor, but they underestimated Mayor Jackson. So why did, why, did, why did many people think Atlanta wouldn't elect a black mayor back in 1970, early 72, 73? Um, Atlanta is in Georgia, and Georgia is in the South. The South had not at that time recognized the politi political rights of African Americans. And so many people said that no white folk would vote for him. But of course some did. And all the black folks supported Maynard and we were glad to see him elected. It's a great day for Atlanta. Do you remember where you were that day when he was elected mayor? You asking me to remember some, well, how long is that? It's almost uh, 32 and 15. You, you're trying to make me remember 50 years. I can't remember 50 minutes, let alone 50 years. <laughs> I don't remember where I was. But you know, that was an important period in, the, in, the, in American history. Not only was Maynard Jackson elected mayor of Atlanta, but Tom Bradley was mayor of California and Los Angeles, and Coleman Young was a mayor in Detroit, and Carl Stokes was a mayor in Cleveland. Why was, why, what was happening that there were so many black men becoming mayors of urban cities? Well, the, the, the cities were becoming black owned and black bought and black borrowed. And it was only fitting that African Americans, who were very often the majority population in urban centers, it was logical, fair, sensible.
that we'd have black males. And Maynard was the first in the Deep South. And he made a record for himself as a cunning, Black mayor. How Maynard, you know, has a, a, a strong pedigree, a strong lineage. His father was Maynard Jackson Sr., his grandfather was John Wesley Dobbs. How important was those two men in terms of what Maynard had to fulfill in terms of his own legacy? Well, I think it was very important. I, I think it, it led him by the nose. Uh, he was a uh, I think he was keen, shrewd politician. And I say politician in the beautiful sense of the word, not the ordinary perception of what a politician is. Hold on a second. Who? When a car goes by, the, do the doorbell rings? What happened? Okay, let's keep going. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Reverend. I don't know where I'm You said he was, cute, he was cute, cunning and he was very smart for a politician. You he was know? a smart politician. And I was asking about the impact of John Wesley Dobbs Oh, they have, I'm sure they had tremendous impact on him as a part of his heritage, but it had an impact on all black people. We were proud of the leadership that these black men had given. I say black men because we hadn't matured enough let women come in yet, but it wouldn't be long. You, you know, you are considered a trailblazer in the civil rights movement with Dr. King and Andy Young and Ralph Abernathy. You were, you led the SCLC during the sixth step after King's assassination. Maynard is looked upon as someone who's sort of a part of the post-civil rights movement where he worked with inside the corridors of power. How important was it to have black men like Maynard working inside the whole political system, from your perspective, being a strong civil rights advocate? Well, I think it was necessary. It was absolutely necessary. And you were lucky if you had a man with Maynard's integrity, uh, you didn't need an Uncle Tom to be in there because he would work against what we were working for on the street. But we worked in the street so that men like Maynard and others could work in the suites and get for us concessions that helped us move toward full citizenship in the community and in this country. And it was historic. Maynard was, you know, Maynard had a habit of, when he had a crucial decision to make, he would call 10 or 12 of us in to talk about it. And after a while, I came to the conclusion that men had already made up his mind <laughs> what, what the decision was going to be. But he wanted us to come in and give affirmation to what he'd already decided. But he was a good thinker, and therefore uh, we were lucky that the man who was at the helm of the ship was on our side. 
you remember any specific story where he had brought some of you in and he already made up his mind? You, you asking me to remember back 50 years and I can't remember back 50 minutes. Okay. Uh, One of your colleagues sometimes didn't agree with Maynard. Hosea Williams had some issues with Maynard. Well, you need a Jose. No matter who the leader is, there needs to be some force that pricks his conscience and reminds him where he came from and where he's going. Jose served that purpose. Uh, I didn't always agree with Jose but I always respected his right to raise ugly questions and keep the politicians on their toes. Their feet to the fire, huh? Yes. In terms of Maynard's role, in terms of the affirmative action that he brought to the city of Atlanta, like with you know Martha the Martha system in the airport, how important was he in, in making sure black businessmen had a piece of the pie? Well, I think he's the best mayor we've had in terms of assuring an equitable portion of those re that revenue that flowed into the city from the private sector, Maynard was adamant that black entrepreneurs and black contractors, etc., received a fair share of the revenue that came to the city. Without his insistence, uh, I don't think we would have gotten as good a share as we did. Uh, although we didn't get what I'd call a fair share, we got a much better share than we would have gotten had not leaders like Maynard Jackson occupied positions that gave them uh, the right to, to veto or the right to encourage certain cuts of the pie. Did, did the white establishment, the white community, the white power structure, did they feel made it in his first two terms as mayor was too radical, too revolutionary? And if so, why? I'm sure some of them did. After all, they never had a black man sit across the table and say, you must do this, you must do that. If you want us to support you, you must support us in increasing our share of the economic pie. And Maynard was good at that. It's not a great way to win friends, but you win support for the people when the people recognize that you're in there fighting for their fair share. Now, after, after Andy Young had been mayor, after Maynard, Maynard decided to run again for mayor. What was your thoughts about him when he decided he wanted to do it a third term? I didn't care. It was all right with me. It was all right with you? Yeah, it was all right with me. Uh, I trusted him. And we, 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 we knew that there were shadows in every city regarding politics. But, and we, we expected Maynard to get his fair share. 
but we trusted him to see that the people got their fair share. And that what made, made it so popular was that the ordinary people felt man was in there fighting for them. And that made the city jumping. Let me ask you this though, Reverend. When, uh, when, when, when the four policemen who, 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 who had brutalized Rodney King and were, were exonerated, the city, like a lot of cities, had a riot. How did the young people respond to, respond to Maynard when he tried to talk them down? A group of young people came to City Hall and, and they seemed to have a problem with Maynard. What was your response to the, to the tension in the city when, after the Rodney King Okay. Well, it's inevitable. One generation challenges another. That's history. And the man represented the power. The young people represented the future and the powerless. So it was inevitable that they'd have conflicts. But he held it. And there were those of us who were able to talk to both sides. Uh, I was pleased that I had the confidence of both sides. What did you say to both sides? What did you say, hmm? Larry? What, what did you say? to sort of quell the tension and the anger? Well, we had to say that we're like the dogs who were in a truck going to a fight. And when they got there, the dogs in the truck were all bleeding and some dead. And somebody said, these dogs forgot they were on the same side. And that's what I reminded both sides, that we're the same side. We're on the same side. We have maybe different perspectives, different uh, techniques and different strategies, but we're on the same side. And we have to always keep that in mind and keep the good of the city central to our behavior. You had made it, with, and you were a part of bringing the Olympics to, to Atlanta in 1996. What was Maynard's involvement in bringing the Olympics to Atlanta in 1996? Well, I think he... He played his part. He and the young, and what's the fellow's name who heads the Masters now? Nah. Billy, uh, Billy Payne. Hmm? Billy Payne. That's it. He and Andy Young and made and others played key roles in bringing the Olympics to Atlanta. It was a great day when we heard the announcement that the next Olympics would be in Atlanta. I was chairman of the modern board of directors when they came. And we, we haul a half million people a day. Without Marta, uh, Atlanta couldn't have held the Olympics. But it was a great day, it was a great uh, bonanza for the city. And Maynard played his role. He, 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 he had influence with white entrepreneurs, white business people, 
who respected him. They may not have liked him, but they respected him. And uh, he played his role in keeping the city on the receiving end of revenue generated by the Olympics. You remember when Maine had Nelson Mandela come to the city? Nelson Mandela. Remember when he came to the city? Yes. How important was that in terms of Maine being having Nelson Mandela come to Atlanta? Oh, well, it was important. And Nelson Mandela, I think it was 1990, I believe, wanted to come to Atlanta. Atlanta stood out as a great city. And Mandela said that when he was in prison, when they could see television, that he saw us marching and demonstrating. And he was encouraged and blessed by what we had done. And that made us all feel good to know that our struggle had impacted the South African struggle. And that apartheid was on his deathbed and soon to be buried. Around 1991-92, Manning was having some health issues. He had bypass surgery, and he decided not to, 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 to try to go for another term as mayor. What was your reaction when he decided not to go for re-election as mayor in the, in, in the mid-90s? When he decided not to? Yeah. Well, I thought it was his right. I think he had a responsibility to his family to protect his health and provide for them uh, what a father, husband ought to provide. So I, I never held it against him. I, I thought he had a perfect right to make his health first in terms of uh, choices. When was the last time you saw Manny Jackson and under what circumstances? You know, you're a nasty fellow. You know, you don't, you don't, you don't respect my age. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'll be 94 before this hits the street. And I don't remember what happened in 1978 and 88. Too far back for me. Uh, it may come to me later. If it does, I'll call you up. That'd be good. And tell you. When you heard that Maynard had passed away, what was your reaction? Well, I was sad. I heard he had passed away. He was stricken in the airport in Washington, the National Airport. Some people call it the Reagan Airport. But I don't. I think it's it's a national airport, and uh, Maynard was on the Lord's work, and God called him home. Um, it was sad because he was still young and still had much to contribute to the progress of the city and the country. And, uh, but um, we loved him and he had a great funeral at the Civic Center, wasn't it? Yes, sir. I remember that. <laughs> I'm going to remember answering your question soon. It's going to come to me by and by when the morning comes. What is Maynard Jackson's legacy? I think we owe 
Maynard the understanding that we have a right to participate in the politics of our country, that nobody has a right to deny us opportunity to seek office, to hold office. I think Maynard set that record straight. Um, we not only could get elected, we could run the place. We could run the city. It was, I was proud to see a black man sitting in the mayor's office in City Hall. And it said to us that we had capabilities that only awaited opportunity to express themselves. We all, Maynard's legacy includes the opening up of wide political opportunities. And I look today as Barack Obama, when he asked me, he called me on the phone, you know, and asked me if I would deliver the benediction or the invocation at his inauguration. He said he hadn't made up his mind which one, but he wanted to know if I'd be with I said, well, hold on, let me check my calendar and see if I have, you know, a vacancy. And I went right with the app, I checked it, it's clear. The date is clear, and I'll be glad you let me know which one. And the next couple of days I read in the paper that I was going to be doing the benediction. And uh, so my friend said, oh, we, we want you to do the invocation. I said, no, the president know what he's doing. When I do the benediction, I'll have a last word, and I'll be able to sum up what happened and set the president on his course for his first quadrennium. Man in Jackson, in my recollection, was one of the smartest politicians I know. And we haven't had a mayor, a mayor as smart as made it in political terms, in my opinion. Hallelujah. Amen. Can we say to the people who send those contributions? Yes, sir. Post office box. I've forgotten the pocket number. Send it to the Lowry Institute. Joseph and Evelyn Lowry Institute. What's the post office box number? 92801. Huh? 92801. 92801. Okay. Send those contributions. We'll put them to good use. Yes, we will. <laughs> okay, I think we can cut. Yeah, I think we can. Cut. <laughs> I think we can. Yay. Okay. Hey, and this is room tone for Reverend Lowry.
You're welcome. Don't cut out that part that I said send those contributions. Okay, I don't want you to cut it out. If you cut it out, I'm going to organize a little party around your house and around your business. Sam and uh, Henry, come quick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take a picture. Come quick. He's gonna take it up before us. Okay. We'll shoot charge now. Yes. I think I also had a. Three, two, one. You're a Braves fan, huh? Happy birthday. Thank you. You're a Braves fan, are you? Yes. Yeah. He's gonna take some more. I like them too. Good. To wind up in ninth place. We're gonna take a photo together. I don't care. Three, two, one. Happy early birthday. Thank you. That looks like a, a drum.